We met together at uh, Georgetown University where uh, in the past we've had these wonderful uh, World War II Memorial Teachers uh, Conferences, but uh, maybe this is the next best thing. I, I certainly hope so. Um, we are now in the 75th anniversary of uh, all of the climactic events of the Second World War. So we are um, alert to uh, the lessons that that war and its leadership may have for our own time. And it's certainly uh, appropriate and important for us to consider them now. I want to talk a little bit about the generation uh, which furnished uh, the bulk of the leadership on the American side uh, during the war, political and military and naval. It's important to make the distinction between military and naval in this case. Uh, when I talk about leadership during that time, particularly uh, leadership uh, in the armed ser services, we're dealing uh, mainly with a generation born uh, in the latter part, or indeed the last part, um, of the uh, 19th century. And for so many of those who were in uniform, their first military experience uh, was in the First World War. And one of the interesting things about that, whether it was Army or Navy, but, main, but mainly Army, uh, is that so many of these uh, officers who became the leaders of the military establishment during the Second World War uh, served together or served uh, under other prominent uh, leaders whom today in the vulgar phrase we would call role models. So many of them knew each other, so many of them had uh, experience uh, together, not only in the First World War, but even before that, uh, in the Spanish-American War and during the Philippine insurrection a little bit later. When I talk about uh, World War II leadership, I'm talking uh, emphatically uh, about an extraordinary president. Uh, and we might say uh, perhaps our greatest indebtedness uh, to him uh, is the relationship that he developed with Winston Churchill in the very late 1930s, before the United States even got into the war, it was through his agency, his persuasiveness, his political leadership uh, that we finally, uh, with an assist from the uh, terrible attack on Pearl Harbor, brought us uh, as a unified country into the war. Who are the leaders we're talking about? Well, on the Army side, we're thinking uh, particularly about the head of the uh, American Army, all during the war, a man who went on later on to uh, become Secretary of State and to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, before I tell you what his name is, perhaps you can infer uh, from a few sentences from the most famous uh, commencement speech uh, ever get ever given, gentlemen? As you know, the situation uh, in Europe uh, is very serious, and we must be about the business of, of helping. He didn't say it exactly like that, but this is really where he made what he called his suggestion, which became the Marshall Plan. But before that, George Marshall, Douglas MacArthur, George Patton. And on the naval side, uh, Chester W. Nimitz, the like of leadership of that quality furnished the country, which was brought into the war uh, fully, fully fledged and fully behind uh, the president and behind our goals uh, because of uh, the episode of Pearl Harbor. These were people who, uh, for the most part, had had very little experience of active uh, combat in serious leadership roles, but who, uh, for the most part, uh, had been educated at the military academies in the country. And in the case of uh, Marshall and those who followed him, and we, we must not forget as we talk about uh, Marshall and MacArthur in that group, also about extraordinary uh, secretaries of war and Navy, uh, they were raised uh, in a culture in which uh, 
taking visible credit and gaining celebrity were the kinds of things that were uh, somehow looked down on. I say somehow. The things they did, they did because they believed it was their duty to do them and not, in particular, call attention to themselves. And, of course, uh, in that cadre of leadership, there was a, a whole platoon of uh, famous characters uh, who uh, were a little bit outside the notion of self-effacement. I'm thinking of uh, George Patton, for example. Would you like to hear a, a, a sample of a Patton speak? Well, uh, in July 1943, Patton uh, leading a uh, division or perhaps a corps ashore at Sicily uh, said to his soldiers, I know a lot of you are, and I'm using his pronunciation, a lot of you are of Italian descent. The reason you're going to be successful, and he used more vulgar language than that, against the Italians against whom you will be fighting, is that you are descended from Italians who came to the New World a century ago, and they had a more vigorous and fertile blood, a braver blood than the Italians who stayed behind their progeny against whom you will be fighting, that kind of thing. I might mention also uh, that Marshall is head of the army and those who worked around him immediately uh, were used to dealing with people who were characters and who frequently did things and said things that would be uh, looked uh, askance at uh, in today's climate of political correctness. Uh, I've seen copies of notes that uh, Marshall wrote uh, his generals, certain of his generals, who misbehaved uh, uh, around women. And uh, basically, he said uh, in his notes, uh, knock it off, get back to work. There was no culture of uh, NBC or CBS or CNN to worry about in those days. Competence and success were the criteria of getting ahead. Uh, for the most part, uh, the officers who fought in the Pacific and in the Atlantic knew about each other and knew what each uh, cohort was doing. And in some, some respects, if they did not resent it, always had the sense that those people fighting in Europe are getting more than we are, and vice versa. Uh, in the Pacific War, which began immediately after uh, Pearl Harbor for us, uh, the United States uh, was engaged mainly in naval and Marine Corps operations, and they were successful. And when you think of that array of uh, admirals, most of them uh, graduates of the Naval Academy in the 1910s, 1920s, educated uh, in, uh, at the Naval War College, and before that, uh, Annapolis, uh, Chester Nimitz. Uh, people of that, of, of that quality uh, and their contemporaries uh, who did uh, almost invariably achieve success in the naval war. The, the whole idea in the Pacific, of course, was to get close enough to Japan uh, to launch uh, airstrikes, uh, in which, of course, is why we uh, operated in the Marianas and, and after that in, in Okinawa. And of course, that war ended with the uh, dropping of the, of the atomic bomb. I might mention uh, in that regard that Franklin Roosevelt visited uh, somebody who knew about Einstein and his work and uh, gave uh, Roosevelt to understand that a quote-unquote terrible bomb might be uh, available to be used at some time in this war, and uh, you should keep that uh, in mind. Franklin Roosevelt, as a wartime leader, uh, many of you probably were raised in families, and uh, perhaps you can remember grandparents uh, who did not like uh, FDR and who, who called him a socialist, etc., etc. Uh, as a wartime leader, he was extraordinary and he was as important to us
and is vigorous and successful a leader, a leader for us, uh, as Winston Churchill, his great friend, was uh, for the British. Saul Bellow, the writer, talked about walking around Chicago as a young man on a twilight evening in the summertime, never being outside the sound, the seductive and engaging sound of that wonderful voice, FDR, talking to the people constantly uh, in, a, in a long array of uh, almost personal messages, which we know today as the fireside chats. He was concerned to uh, take the pulse of the country and reading that pulse to feed it as much as he possibly could uh, about the successes and some of the uh, failures uh, of our armed forces at that time. The Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, these were persons of important consequence. Uh, the great wartime conferences, which were covered in those days, there was no television, but radio, cons radio transcriptions and uh, newspapers covered them. These occurred on average every five or six months. They were attended by uh, military and naval and political people. The United States frequently, the president was accompanied by the Secretary of State, Secretary of War, and his principal uh, advisors, uh, pe people like, uh, like General Marshall. So those uh, represent uh, the bulk of the cadre of our leadership in the Second World War. Uh, it's interesting that we remember them now uh, for what they were able to accomplish, but also uh, because they're those that they led, for the most part, they admired them, and those that they led, many of whom are still living, they are in their, uh, the majority in their early 90s by now, uh, and some of them, uh, of course, are, are, are leaving us. Uh, uh, it's important in a time in which military history is uh, not particularly cherished in academic uh, culture. It's important that you, teaching high school age students, uh, stress the importance of that legacy for us. I think, uh, I remember uh, in particular an experience I had at the College of William and Mary when the president of that college was uh, congratulating new members of Phi Beta Kappa and he uh, enjoined them. Think for a moment about a high school teacher back home who is more responsible than anyone in your life except maybe for your families for setting you on the road to uh, embracing the academic ethos, kindling your natural curiosity in the uh, liberal arts disciplines responsible for your being here. So I would leave you with that message. Uh, be great ambassadors for ambassadors for the study of all history, American history, and American military history. And it's a pleasure to have you at the World War II uh, Memorial and uh, the next time you are here in person, and not virtually, we will all go to the memorial uh, together. Best of luck. Thanks.